what is going on guys welcome back to another video and in today's video we are continuing our journey through the pixar theory so we left off in the last video with the prehistory we talked about the forming of the world in elemental we moved on to the event that shifted this world into its own time in the good dinosaur then we brought talked about how magic was brought into this world kind of from the future but then kind of not but we're not quite there yet at this point in the story but where we are at now is we've caught up to a point where we can go into the modern day era of the pixar theory and this era stretches all the way from the 1950s with the incredibles and it's going to go all the way around to almost 2020 in seoul so this will be the longest version of this where we have to actually talk about and a lot of this is kind of connected so you really are going to want to go and check out that first video to understand where we are and where we left off in the pixar theory but we're going to pick up our story with the incredibles so we get another bit of a time jump from meredith's time in medieval scotland all the way up to the to the incredibles and essentially the incredibles too what we're seeing here is is the world is was and is and will f hopefully in the future be full of superheroes. Now, there is a bit of a theory that the superheroes are actually made by the government and they're given their powers by the government, but then their powers can also be inherited and passed down into the next generation, which we see with the Incredibles kids. You know, Dash, Violet, Jack-Jack, and they're even getting stronger because Jack-Jack is by far the most powerful Incredible, even as a baby, because he has a crazy number of superpowers. But, that couldn't last forever. The damage they were causing was too great. People finally decided to su to sue, and they actually made it where supers were illegal. And then they tried to reverse that in Incredibles 2, and I feel like they were actually fairly successful. But what Incredibles actually brings to the table isn't so much the humans. We see the technology is kind of retro-futuristic, in a sense, where they have technology that's futuristic, but still kind of retro in that you know it's not like highly sci-fi it's just like modern technology that can do way bigger things but the technology is actually the important part because we actually see in the adaptoid that syndrome creates to take out the supers that ai is a thing and he has brought ai into the world and the ai can think and it can go but they do ultimately end up beating it now the Incredibles are probably the peak of human because how much better can you get with humans and superpowers? And this is where humans kind of start to level out. We've already beaten the animals, essentially. But what we also now have is technology. And technology actually can make people super. We see that with Syndrome. We see that with the Screenslaver who uses technology to combat people with superpowers. And though the superpowers do end up winning, we don't really see superhumans all that often the rest of the time through the timeline we do get kind of like humans with super abilities but we don't really get to see a lot of what humans can do after the fact on the incredibles but technology continues to hide out and we can get into that here in the next couple of movies that we're going to go over but after the incredibles we can actually get drawn down into here with luca now, with Luca, Luca is really special because it shows that not only do humans, animals, and technology exist in this universe, but so do monsters, particularly sea monsters in this case, okay? And so the sea is one place that we haven't really conquered, especially not at the point, point where Luca would take place in the timeline. So people have stories of tales of sea monsters that are living within the ocean. And now, this could just be one of two things, okay? It could be... These were a race of super beings that just adapted to the water in their our own little split branch, or just humans that had super, or humans born with superpowers that were shunned and that went into the water. Or it could be that monsters from the future, like, like we see with Randall in Monsters, Inc., that have been cast all the way back into the 1950s and kind of retroactively implanting the ability for monsters to take hold later on in the future. But now, I almost like to think also that this has a little something to do with the fact that magic was brought into this world because the human or the monsters that are in the sea, the sea monsters, when they go on land, they just look like regular humans and they can interact with regular humans. And what they might have actually done there is, is interbreed in with humans because at the end of the movie, we see that monsters are accepted, at least by this town in Sicily. So now you've got humans with the ability to have superpowers, which could come from the government using the magic that exists in this universe to 
to create superhumans. And then you have these monsters, which can have have magic on themselves to change into humans, and it just implants into the humans' DNA going forwards that humans are going to, A, have magic just kind of within themselves, but also have this genetic quirk that will enable the monsters to take rise later on down the timeline. But we don't have to worry about that for now, because the next major event that happens within the Pixar universe is a movie named Lightyear that a little boy named Andy goes to see and falls in love with the lead character of that movie in Buzz Lightyear. So much so that he asked for that toy for his birthday. Thus bringing us into the events of Toy Story and Toy Story 2. Now, here's the fun part about toys. The toys aren't necessarily technology coming to life. They have their own soul. Now, this might not be that big of a thing in the Pixar universe because magic exists but what is giving magic to the toys and the idea is, is it's actually their proximity to humans and now up to this point in the universe we actually have humans which just have built into their dna a passive ability for magic and being close to humans in this world has kind of shifted off onto the toys and as long as the toys hold are held dear to their respective kids and played with and have sh their children have strong memories and connection to these toys it allows these toys to come to life and they come to life believing their own history until that they were kind of like manufactured with kind of so like you know like buzz still thinks he's a space ranger woody at some point probably thought he was a cowboy and they kind of play these roles really well but ultimately at the end of the day they do understand they are just toys being played with but they have a need to be played with and the because they know the longer you're not played with, like Squeaks on Toy Story 2, he's on a shelf and he's actually dying because Andy is forgetting him. And it's human memory and the passive magic that's coming through that, that is actually feeding these toys and allowing toys to come to life within the Pixar world. And Pixar does kind of throw little hints in there because you'll see toys not quite be in the same spot. So you know most toys in the Pixar universe are coming to life as long as they're being played with. But this is kind of the first step into what could ultimately lead to what I consider probably the peak of technology kind of taking over the planet in cars. But we're going to get to that later on also. That'll be in the next video. Right now, we can actually jump into the events of Finding Nemo and Finding Dory. Now, you kind of got to look at this as just like, well, animals haven't completely gone off the radar. What, what has happened here kind of is that they live in the ocean. And so not many humans are in the ocean. So... They haven't regressed all the way back to the point of just being completely dumb animals. They have retained a bunch of their intelligence to the point where a lone clownfish and his friend could actually traverse an entire ocean to find his son. And then in the next movie, you see that they're actually smart enough straight up where they can full on escape an aquarium and drive a truck. But what we also see here is the pollution of the planet is actually starting to become bad. In just the shallow water off the coast of California, you see what is essentially a dump of containers. And within that, you see that the animals are using these to hide in, using them to create shelters. And this is kind of the precursor to later to what is just going to be a continuing problem throughout this entire theory of humans destroying the planet that we call home to the point where we will eventually need to leave the planet. Before all that happens, Pixar has to remind us that magic does exist in this universe. So this is where we get to the events of Turning Red. So Turning Red has magic throughout their entire history, and it's actually really closely connected to bears. So they turn into red pandas. Red pandas are actually not bears, but it's actually kind of similar magic to what happens in Brave, whereas they just kind of took it a step further, making this curse that they call it a part of themselves and a part of their family. But the problem is, is throughout the years, the technology has advanced. Living in relative peace and not war, they don't need their ability to turn into their to their panda forms to protect their families anymore. So it's went from being a solid blessing to a solid curse all the way until the events of Turning Red, where the heroine in there decides that she is going to live in harmony with her panda and not get rid of it or not trap it. But what I think this means for the Pixar universe is it's more of just like a reawakening. All humans have this magic within them. Some can activate it, some can't. But this do basically turns her into a super. And it's probably the first super we've seen realistically since The Incredibles. And their t 
time before the superheroes actually finally just stopped being mainstream. And all of this is just to remind us that superhumans and magic can it still exist in this universe. But what we do have to show is that animals haven't all gone away on land either. So in Ratatouille, we see a rat named Remy who just wants to be a chef. And he is actually a better chef than some of the humans out there. So the animal's intelligence is kind of going up a little bit with, you know, the rats from Ratatouille actually being able to inevitably run a restaurant alongside the humans and he can cook as good as a master chef can. And what it actually does bring in also is, is like the critic in Ratatouille is just fully accepting of the fact that, oh, this rat can cook and he knows how to cook and he makes delicious food and the food is more important than what is making it. And this opens up the door a little bit for us in to go into Up, where we see Charles Muntz using dogs that can straight up cook. He said Absalon is the best chef he's ever had. And that is an incredible thing because it rolls right in with Ratatouille where animals are cooking. But Muntz is also using technology to give his dogs the ability to talk. And not only that, he is looking for what it is for Kevin, which is a supposedly non-existent bird that could, one, potentially, there is a big theory out there that Kevin's eggs have the ability to kind of extend life, so a magical bird, but also the last remnant of the dinosaurs that you could truly find outside of just regular birds. But I think the big thing we can take from Up is, is one, gravity on this planet is definitely different. All those balloons could not have lifted that house. But two, animals are evolving along with humans and humans are starting to look at animals less as these things that are just with us on this planet to our true equals on this planet and when you combine that with the fact that there are monsters out there plus magic plus these superhumans it's all just kind of going to eventually meld into one strange thing that you could kind of find at the end but we're going to have to move away from up for a minute and move on into Toy Story 3. And in Toy Story 3, the toys are being forgotten. Pixar has to remind us here that no, human memory is very important to the events of Toy Story. The toys, to bring these things to life, humans have to be play a role. And humans play a role throughout the Pixar theory, essentially as living batteries in an essence. It's the human memory, the human spirit, the human's magic that's allowing the technology, the it toys, the animals, all of these things to maintain some level of real intelligence and real work workout. And it's pat and you can see that this is actually a passed down thing. But what you also see in Toy Story 3 is it's really hard for Woody himself to let go of Andy. He is Andy's toy, and that is actually more exemplified in the events of Toy Story 4. Now in Toy Story 4, we see Woody kind of go off. He gives up the thing in his voice box that would make him even worth playing with. He chooses to go with Bo Peep and live his own life helping lost toys or helping toys in general find their children and their forever homes and let their magic continue and let these toys continue to live. But I think what Woody has actually developed here is his own soul, his own being. He is his own person or he has taken or more specifically, he is Andy. He has taken over the role, uh, or taken over Andy's personality and has used Andy's magic and Andy's soul to create himself within Woody, if that makes sense. Like, Woody the toy has used Andy to create Andy within itself. It's kind of a weird little mix-up, and it's really hard to explain until we get to the next movies in the timeline. Now... The next movies we have sit in our timeline are actually Inside Out, then Coco, then Soul. And I think this was very deliberate. So in Inside Out, we see how human emotion works. And Inside Out 2 is coming out soon. Hopefully that will be we'll be able to expand that onto my time our timeline, and I can always do an update video whenever that movie comes out. And I think in Inside Out 2, we get into even more complex emotions. But in Inside Out, we see how, how our emotions can actually help shape us into what we are. It's our emotions and the magic within our emotions that enables our memories, our core personality traits, which is what, who makes us us. And then if we move on to Coco, we actually see the spiritual side of that. Whereas if you take these memories and you carry those on after the person has passed away they can survive at least in the hispanic culture here where they have figured out with the dia de los muertos and the day of the dead that their memories can actually come back 
And as long as there's someone remembers you and your stories are passed down, your memory is passed down, you can continue living on into the afterlife. And you can essentially gain immortality in this way once you've died. As long as your ancestors remember you and put your name up on, or you don't even have to put them up on the ofrenda, as long as your memory and your stories are passed on, your memory and your soul will continue to live on. And it's really funny that the next movie in the timeline would be called Soul. And Soul is all about helping a lost soul go to Earth and gaining. And in this, we see how souls work in the Pixar world. We see them finding what they're meant to do, finding their calling. We see how if you can get in the zone, you can go to this place. And that's, I think, is just magic, connecting us to the spiritual world. And it shows us that not all spiritual worlds look the same. We have the pre-life essentially in soul so we see how souls are selected and sent down to earth and there's no saying that these things that these souls have to embody humans what if they could also embody toys or inanimate things or and they'll obviously be able to do monsters because there's no real timeline where we're at it takes place in 2020 but the actual you know before life essentially is just whenever it needs to be so we see in these three movies how souls are created, how they're uh, formed and flourished and flushed out, and then what can happen to them once they actually have passed away. And they're a little bit odd, uh, out of order in the release, but all of these things can eventually come back into one another in these three movies, just giving us, they're really flushed out on how all of this magic is working. Guys, I'm gonna have to leave it off right there for this video, that pretty much covers modern times and how all of those movies have connected and one has fed into the other. And in the next video, I'm going to go ahead and go over the future in the Pixar timeline. And that is going to go from Cars all the way up to Monsters, Inc. and kind of roll back into Brave. So if, let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. Did I miss anything? Do you like want me to explain anything more and maybe go a little bit more in depth into any of this? And in which case, I definitely will. But I need to know what you guys want to see down in the comments. And while you're down there, guys, please remember to hit that like button, hit the subscribe button, turn on that notification bell so you never miss another video from me. And I will see you guys in the next video.